everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton, and on today's episode, we're interviewing another wonderful speaker at the upcoming Fusion Conference, which is happening October 18th through 21st in Nashville, Tennessee. It's going to be a good time. It's selling out quickly, so please go to the websites and get your tickets. Ken, you have just come back from multiple journeys. I am not 100% sure of where you are in the world right now, but thank you for taking time uh, to join us and uh, and our guest with us today. Ken, would you like to do the introductions? Yeah, um, I just returned from the nation of Jordan uh, yesterday as we're recording this. And uh, I'm leaving on Tuesday to go to Albania. You could ask, why in the world are you doing that? And the answer is, well, I'm trying to stay married. So sometimes I have to come home, see my wife and kids. Um, to, on, the, on the show today, um, I have Stacy Campbell. And she and her husband, Wesley, used to pastor up in the uh, British Columbia uh, area around Victoria. Um, I think it was Kelowna, as I remember uh, yes, exactly. Kelowna. Kelowna is how you pronounce it. That's okay, it. Kelowna. And so Stacy and Wesley and I have known each other and gone back to the uh, time of great outpourings in the vineyard movement. Um, the, Stacy and Wesley have uh, developed their own ministry beyond the church. They stopped pastoring and became translocal a while back. And Stacy's one of the speakers at our Fusion Conference. So Stacy, it's great to be connecting with you online and welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to come and hang out with all those prophets and miracle works you've, you've got coming to Fusion. Yeah, I'm excited about this conference because we're really pushing to go beyond healing. Not that there's anything wrong with healing. It's bread and butter stuff. Jesus said healing is the children's bread. But I've seen um, and I've preached on the fact that there's at least four levels of breakthrough. We've got healing. We've got miracles. We've got extraordinary miracles. And then we've got this sort of overwhelming breakout where the gospel advances so rapidly, it just overwhelms all the principalities and powers, spiritual opposition, and people are swept into the kingdom. Paul had a breakout like this in Ephesus. It's recorded in Acts 19, verse 20. Um, so, you know, for the longest time, we've, we've specialized and talked about healing and praise God for healing. I don't in any way mean to, uh, to minimize it, but in this conference, we're going after uh, prophecy as a catalyst, and we're talking about the ministry of miracles as well. Um, so with that, Stacy, let's let's just acquaint our listeners a bit with you. How did you how did you come into the realm of the prophetic? Because I certainly remember a very dramatic change in you when all this came upon you. Yeah, well, so I come from a, a very conservative background. When I was a child, I had a dream where Jesus appeared to me, and you know, from that moment on, I just sort of knew things, but. I was never in a uh, church community that explained anything to me about the prophetic. So I just, I didn't understand it. And then uh, I became really a, a disciple of Jesus in the Plymouth Brethren movement, which is a cessationist movement started by J. Nelson Darby in the 1800s. And he began to preach that all the gifts of the Holy Spirit had passed away. And you know, he was trying to do a renewal movement where we went back to New Testament where, you know, so we, we went so back to the New Testament, we had no musical instruments the women wore head coverings and the and were silent in the church we believed all the gifts of the holy spirit had passed away and um but they loved the bible you know and so it was that was a they discipled me in the bible but very anti not just prophecy anti miracles anti healing anti everything that was in the new testament with the exception of the gospel and so uh after that i went to university for five years after which i went to baptist seminary and the seminary reinforced the cessationist position that the plymouth brethren had so i uh you know i, I swallowed that hook line and sinker believe that people that do what i do were uh emotionally disturbed at best or demon possessed at worst and uh, i was very anti-charismatic and would preach to all my friends my pentecostal friends if i went to their church and you know they all started speaking in tongues i'd take out my bible and show them from the bible that you know they shouldn't be doing that anyway um 
And then at, we planted a Baptist church, a regular Baptist church, which is a very conservative form, like more conservative probably than Southern Baptist. And uh, when uh, we were praying and thanking God for the year, we suddenly the Holy Spirit came in the room very much like Acts 2. And all of us who were all cessationists, like we had a Dallas seminary, uh, one of our elders had a master's from Dallas seminary, the other guys were from Baptist churches, and all Plymouth Brethren churches, even exclusive Plymouth, Plymouth Brethren backgrounds. So we didn't have any understanding of what that was and how that looked. So we just began to bind every demon, you know, and take our authority in Christ and say it is written, you know, what Jesus did when he was confronted with the demonic. And the more that we bound the demons and the more that we uh, prayed for God to help us and cried out to God, uh, the more that we were filled with the Holy Spirit. And there were three of us in particular that got physically filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the elders, you know, just it was as though a giant fist hit him on his head. He slammed into the couch and jumped off the couch and just began shaking and falling. And I began shaking and another uh, uh, worship leader began shaking sovereignly. Nobody teaching us this. This was not something that we were expecting. This was something we were actually against. And so when it happened to us, it was very Acts 2-ish. And I went back to the Bible because I didn't want anything that wasn't in the Bible. I, I, I love the word of God. And so I went back to Acts 1, where Jesus tells the disciples to go wait until they receive power from on high. And they will be his witnesses, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And this power was to be a witness and in Acts 2, so we all know the story, they go to the upper room, they wait 10 days, and, uh, and when the power falls in the upper room, when the, when the power falls, uh, what happens is they're all physically filled with the Holy Spirit. It was not simply a, you know, a something that was going on in their head. They were physically filled with the Holy Spirit, so much so that Peter, his exegesis of the Pentecost experience is he said, these men of Israel, you know, these people are not drunk like you think because they physically were incapacitated. They looked like they were drunk. He said, no, this is what Joel is talking about. And he begins to give a an Old Testament explanation of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. And when he gives that explanation, he said, Joel, this is what Joel said, in the last days. And right there, everything just changed because because he said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And what would happen when men and women, the spirit was poured out on all flesh. You know, old men would dream dreams. Young men would have visions. Uh, men and women would prophesy. And so Peter's explaining Pentecost to a Jewish community from the Old Testament, but it was like the scales went off my eyes when I went back to, you know, having had a Pentecost type of experience, because what happened was we all began to speak in tongues at the top of our lungs, as well as we began shaking violently, physically. And, um, you know, we, we could not control it, even though people say, well, the Bible says the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. And, uh, and, I have a huge explanation of that, which is for a different time, but I want to finish the Acts 2 thing. And then he says this, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he's quoting from Joel 2, describing Pentecost with the physical manifestations and the prophetic. And what happened to us in our Baptist church was this was only our elders at this meeting, and three of us were filled, began speaking in tongues, which we were vehemently against, and began physically shaking. But the byproduct was when it hit the church a week, two weeks, three weeks later, I mean, 
we had revival. We became the fastest growing Baptist church in Canada until the Baptists wouldn't let us be Baptists anymore because they found out we spoke in tongues. But they, we, we, hundreds of people got saved. The atmosphere was electric with revival. We would have baptisms planned for 20, 30 people, you know, in the hot tub, which we rolled into our, into our, our, our lease space in our little Baptist church. And uh, people that were, uh, uh, had come to church, they said, what hinders me from, from getting baptized? And people would jump into the baptismal tank, say, I have to get baptized. I have to follow Christ in fullness. And, you know, with their, with their leather shoes on, their suits on, their ties on. And, and it was just crazy, the revival we had. And this was 1987, 88. And it spread to uh, whoever it spread to, I mean, if they were an unbeliever, they they virtually all got saved. It was incredible. Unbelievers would walk in our church, burst into tears, say, we don't know what's happening. We never cry and, you know, come and follow Christ. But also the other dynamic was people were being filled with the Holy Spirit constantly. And it they all just began to shake. They began to fall. They began to weep. But Many of them began also to prophesy who had never, they'd never prophesied before in their life. And that was true of me. I'd never prophesied before in my life. Uh, I, I preached against it. I, I went to seminary and studied against it. I did papers against it in seminary. And this is, this was the phenomenon, but the fruit was so many people got saved. So many people got, you know, uh, re repented of sin. We, uh, they, that nobody telling them to. The spirit of conviction was there, and the freedom in Christ that came. But the great thing was, it like a mini revival broke out, and and from there, everywhere we touched, more revival broke out, because that is the progression. The prayer movement. Wait till you receive power. The power falls, people begin to prophesy, they're physically affected, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is saved, and, you know, revival breaks out. So we can expect this to increase in the last days. We can expect so much more of this, because in Acts 2, it didn't end in Acts 2, like the cessationists tell you, or later in the book of Acts, or even the epistles, it it ended, uh, it ends, the, uh, it was 120 people were filled with the Holy Spirit in, in, in the upper room. They said there was that many in the upper room. But the Bible says it's going to happen one day to all flesh. This will happen to believers and unbelievers alike. And just like the Apostle Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, he had a prophetic encounter on the Damascus Road. He first words, he got knocked off, you know, to the ground. And the first words out of his mouth is, who are you, Lord? And this, these encounters are going to increase in the last days. They will happen to believers. They will happen to unbelievers. And the byproduct will be salvation. But everybody will have a, an opportunity to, to see Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19.10. And we have to have a church and the, the church equipped to understand what the very testimony of Jesus is. It is the spirit of prophecy. So to have churches that don't have prophecy in their churches they lack the very testimony of jesus himself in their fellowship and in their communing and so we need to actually equip the saints so that they understand this and prepared for it and uh so that revival can happen with them and edification exhortation and comfort can happen and 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 the and the testimony of jesus comes to individuals and communities so i'm very passionate about at that as you can see yeah. Well, I've I've said for many years that prophecy is always on the leading edge of revival, and you can see it many places in the Bible. John the Baptist precedes Jesus. Jeremiah gets raised up to work alongside of Josiah. Um, you know, we could just go right down the list. Of course, we would be remiss to omit Moses being raised up as a prophet to deliver the people of Israel. So or it, Elijah it, in the last days, you know, and exactly. he's going to say Elijah, the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord for the restoration of family. I, I mean, that's a prophetic mandate. We we have to have prophets. 
Absolutely, we do. And for so long, um, it's been, I think, just the, the only right way to say it is uh, it's been quenched. And this, the scripture commands us not to quench the Spirit's fire, not to despise prophetic utterance. And yet, in many cases, it's happened and the church has been the worse for it, or at least weakened by it. And, you know, with this, I think what you said, with all these people coming and gathering because of, because of prophecy breaking out, Everybody wants to know that God is real. Everybody wants to know God is alive. For too long, we were told, and I can remember hearing this as a kid, for too long, we were told, well, you know, you're just supposed to take it on faith. Jesus said, blessed are those who have, have not seen and yet they believe. And he did say that, but that doesn't mean that the overall witness of the church is that nothing ever happens. God never speaks. There are no miracles, and we're just supposed to faith it through and hope for the best, keep our fingers crossed, and maybe on the last day we'll find out we were right. I don't think that's God's way. I don't think he strings us along in that fashion. Not at all. So I, I totally agree with you there, and I think that we really need to be preparing the church through proper teaching of what the New Testament's all about. You don't see uh, any of the apostles uh, where where they're not expecting the miraculous in the time of Jesus and and seeing the miraculous and and greater works Jesus said than he did what those who believe in him do and his disciples and followers do and that's the expectation of Jesus that we actually move into greater works so when you study the works of Jesus say okay I'm supposed to do that and more. I'm supposed to believe for that and more. Of course, God's the healer. God's the giver of the gifts, but but he is still alive today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we really need to prepare people. Yeah, amen. So, all right, so you get, well, it sounds like with that first meeting, catapulted would not be, uh, it wouldn't even be a hyperbole, right? It's, I mean, you were literally catapulted a Across the room, and I can remember uh, many meetings that Lonnie Frisbee led where that sort of dynamic was in play. So you get catapulted into prophetic ministry, and um, you know you you start to develop this reputation as a prophetess. Um, give us some stories. Uh, people love to hear stories. Tell us some stories of amazing prophetic words and how they were fulfilled. Maybe just one or two or three. Depends on what's on the top of your mind. Well, I, I, honestly, by now, I've probably prophesied over hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, I, I think that every gift God gives is a is a service gift. In other words, God doesn't give someone the gift of leadership so they can lead themselves around or someone the gift of prophecy so they can prophesy to themselves or someone the gift of mercy to be merciful to themselves. Every gift God gives is so that we get to serve somebody else. And so, you know, I serve with that gift and I've, I, 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 I make myself every place I go prophesy and prophesy and prophesy and serve with my gift. And so I've seen so many crazy things. Uh, I, I, I don't know where to start. Uh, uh, I I was in I uh, I remember going to a meeting in Brazil once with a a leader, and this leader actually had come with me to uh, it was a solemn assembly. I was I was the international director for the call at that point, and I was putting on solemn assemblies in many different nations and gathering elders and leaders and and so I would gather leaders from different movements. And we would come together to have a a, a day of repentance and a, a, you know examine ourselves as it were, so that we judge ourselves so that we're not judged. And um, I invited because Brazil was you know largely Catholic, a Catholic leader that I had met uh, years before and prophesied over. And I invited him to come and repent on behalf of the Catholic Church. And he invited me down to a meeting he was doing in Argentina the following week. So he came to Brazil with me. And then I went to a, 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 a meeting with him in Argentina. And he was doing reconciliation meetings between different streams of the body of Christ. And so at that meeting, I was just sitting on the second row. They had a Pentecostal uh, uh, prophetic guy. They had a Baptist pastor and they had a Catholic. He was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. 
and he was a cardinal and he was preaching on um, uh, Philippians chapter two. And anyway, while he opened the Bible, all he was doing was reading Philippians chapter two. And the Lord, I went into an open vision, uh, the the whole stadium kind of lit up and I saw, uh, I heard the audible voice of God, where as he was reading Philippians chapter two, it says this, um, that though he thought equality with God, something, nothing to be grasped, he humbled himself, took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. So that's what the scripture says. That's what he was reading. And, uh, and the Lord speaks to me oddly and says, these are not just words on a page to this man. This is his whole life. And I begin weeping. The spirits fa falls on me. And so then I said to the guy next to me that brought me, I said, could he pray for me? Uh, because I don't think you can get humility from impartation, but maybe a grace to, you know, humble yourself more. I, he must have captured the heart of God in doing that. And I just wanted to be, you know, gather that like god said that this was something in his life and so um i was taken up there and and the fellow that brought me up there didn't speak english very well so he thought i said that i wanted to pray for this cardinal where as i actually asked him to ask the cardinal to pray for me anyway so when i get there the cardinal puts his head down Oh, puts his hands like this, and I put my hands on his shoulder, and I just simply quote the words the Lord had said that, you know, those words in Philippians were not just words on a page to you. That's your whole life. And then the rest of Philippians 2 comes to mind, which says about Jesus, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And we, we know that, that scripture. And the Lord speaks to me, but because he so humbled himself, I'm going to give him the highest name in the Catholic church, and he'll become the next pope. And so I, I was in the spirit, and I said it. And that was 2007, I think it was, maybe six, maybe 2008, sometime in there. Um, and uh, and I said it, and he, he opened his eyes through translation. There was a translator, and, you, you know, that was that. But in 2013, I believe, when uh, Cardinal Bergoglio became Pope, I re remembered that, that Benedict had resigned and I was going, oh no, oh no, what are the odds of a Pope resigning? Because Benedict had just become Pope before I prophesied that on him. And you know, they only had three Popes in all of church history resigning. I started studying that out and uh, I, they haven't had a Pope resign in 600 years. So for that prophecy to come true, it was like the odds were so crazy. Anyway, when the white smoke finally came up, it was Cardinal Bergoglio that became Pope, who's now Pope Francis. And you know, when I tell that story, the, it was it was a very specific prophecy. It was about him becoming Pope. It was about the humility God saw in his heart. It's about the scriptural principle that he who humbles himself will be exalted. And we all know from scripture that God can choose a leader and they can be you know, like David, a man after his own heart. But even David can go astray. Even a man after God's own heart can, you know, uh, not finish well or whatever. So I, I like to put parameters around the prophetic word. That prophetic word was accurate. That doesn't mean that everything that Pope Francis does, you know, is the, I endorse or even know what Pope Francis does. I think we have to be, you know, specific and clear where a prophecy begins and where it ends and and what what those parameters are too. So that's how you you judge it. You judge it if it actually happens. And it doesn't make a statement on the full life story of any person that you prophesy over. So yeah they still have their Christian responsibility to follow God their whole life or to turn to God if they're not turning to God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's a really, really good cautionary word, Stacey. I'm really glad you said that. Um, and not just because of the Pope, but because in general, um, you know, people give words to people and we can't control 
what they might do. Uh, they may obey it partially. They may choose to disregard it completely and go in the opposite direction, uh, perhaps because of what the Bible calls a stiff neck. Um, but like the Jonah? point is, <laughs> for example, sure. So, uh, so we can we can talk about uh, the value of prophecy, but at the end, prophecy still needs to be uh, something that guides us, but we have to obey the Lord on an ongoing basis. It's an amazing story, though, that you, uh, you know, you prophesied uh, the Pope. Um, I've had, not with Popes, but I've had some encounters like that with heads of state in various countries. And um, it, you, I don't know about you, but with me, there's always a bit of trepidation. Oh, my gosh, what am I saying here? And Lord, I really hope I'm hearing you correctly. That kind of a internal heart posture. I think... Uh with every gift that we serve with, we handle it lightly and, you know, we can't, it, it can never become part of our identity. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a prophet. I'm a this, I'm a that. It, and it's also, I always have that. Oh, oh Lord, oh Lord. And I usually give a preamble before I prophesy because I feel what you just said is so important. I say, I'm good in the, in, we no longer stone adulterers in the new testament even those caught in the very act you know as as the scripture says we no longer uh, stone all the people that were stoned in the old testament and we no longer stone prophets in the new testament but what we do do in the new testament is judge prophecy and that's where we need to train and equip people how to judge a prophetic word so i always say before i prophesy i'm going to prophesy and Every time I prophesy, it takes faith. I don't, I don't know everything. I, I, I unless God shows it to me, I know nothing, and um, and so I always say, I, every I'll do my part and prophesy according to my faith, which is Romans twelve, and you do your part and weigh carefully what has been said. And I said, at the end of the day, if we love one another, we've done the whole Bible: love God and love one another. At least. The whole, the hard part, you know, the the law and the prophets, like Jesus said, if we if we love God and love each other, we've done the the fulfillment. That's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So I think that uh, it, it's important to train people that they take a prophetic word and they, like Timothy had to do, wage war with that prophetic word if it's not yet happening in their life, uh, which is what I've done. I have an incredible story of my son you know, where I waged war with a prophetic word over his life. And, and I've seen that happen over and over again, where prophecy becomes a, a weapon of warfare. And our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. And prophecy becomes something when we mix our faith with it, we see the greater works of God happen in the lives of our loved ones and our, in our ministries, etc. Amen. So, you just mentioned your son, and one of the things we're talking about at the Fusion Conference is how prophecy and miracles converge. You know, it's interesting in the spirit for those who are seers. Um, usually the color for prophecy is kind of a, we call it cyan blue. It's a very deep electric blue. Um, and similarly for miracles, people who are miracle workers or function in miracles, uh, sometimes people see them garbed in that kind of electric blue. This is, I think, an indicator from the spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, but also in the realm of spiritual things, uh, that there is some sort of continuum or connectivity between prophecy and miracles. So you mentioned your son um, and how prophecy was on the front end of it. How did miracles become the caboose to that train? Okay, that's an excellent question. And I'm going to tell tell it in a story form, which is a true story, which right. is the story of my my son. So I was speaking at a prophetic conference uh, at the end of September in 2013. So this is already a decade ago. And um, I at the end of the conference, the young prophetic guy that I was with, we were just talking about the meetings and debriefing a little bit. And all of a sudden he said, Stacy, I just had a very clear vision. And in the vision, a tsunami wave of healing 
it, a healing and miracles, a tsunami wave of miracles, you know, hit your church. I saw your church. I saw this tsunami wave. I knew it was a wave of miracles hit your church. He said, I mean, it's big, like the lame will walk the blind will see kind of thing. And I went, oh, that's awesome. And as I am want to do when I receive a prophetic word, I, I pray it. I take it and I say, Lord, thank you that this is your intention. This is your will that you want to see miracles and healings. You don't have to have a prophetic word to that. You just have to read your Bible to know that that's the, the will of God to, to, to see things, uh, to, to, to break out in the miraculous. It, 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 that's one of his names. He's the God who heals us. But anyway, so I took that prophetic word and I prayed it two or three or four nights in a row. And I, I reminded God of all the prophecies that he'd spoke about our church, that we would see miracles, that we would see healings. And, and I just took it before and I waged war. And I, you know, and after a little while, I kind of forgot if the Lord brought it up. Well, a week later, um, uh, and a month before that, uh, a month before this incident also, uh, I had a prophetic intercessor from Germany say that she saw my son Judah and how is, how was he doing? I said, he's doing fine. And she said, I said, why? She said, well, I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw him in a rugby uniform and I, I just got hit with this weeping and tears. I said, well, maybe you're supposed to pray for him. So a month ahead, she gets a prophetic vision scrolling through Facebook when she sees my son's face. A week before, um, I get this prophecy about healing and miracles breaking out in our church, like the lame will walk. And a week later to the day, um, I was doing a prophetic conference in Madison, Wisconsin with uh, Stephen Springer and uh, Doug Addison at the time. And uh, when I got up to speak on Saturday afternoon, uh, Doug just started weeping and weeping. And he said, I'm sorry. He told me this at supper. He said, I'm sorry I got up and left. Uh, but he said, when you, when you stood up to speak, I got hit with this incredible wave of grief and I felt like a spirit of death was a trying to attack your family or the speaker's family so I texted 300 of my intercessors and I just went to the back and wept through your whole sermon and he didn't tell me this till we met for supper and I said wow I said well I don't know what that is uh, uh, but I, I'm feeling fine, but thank you for prayer. And maybe it's preemptive. And about half an hour later, I get a call from my husband who's in emergency. And he said, Stacy, Judah has been in an accident and it's very serious. He said, it's so serious. He said that, um, uh, the, uh, uh, that he was playing rugby and he got tackled in the ruck and he heard this big snap crack and he he's you know he he broke his he broke his neck he, and he severely injured his spinal cord he has a severe injury the doctors are saying 98 percent chance he will be a quadriplegic for the rest of his life but he's awake would you like to talk to him and i said of course i said mm -hmm. so he my husband put the phone by my son's ear and i said judah it's mom i said um how are you doing and he said mom I can't feel anything. I can't feel anything below my neck. And I said, well, Judah, the first words out of my mouth, because I'd been meditating on John chapter five about the layman being, you know, in the pool of Siloam for the last eight months. The first words out of my mouth, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, were Judah, things that are impossible with man are possible with God. I'm going to go pray. And so I went into a little room all by myself that night and I began to pray and I took the prophecies over my son's life, over my children's life. And I went, I found a throne room passage because the Bible says that we, that we have, uh, we can go before boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need. So I found a throne room passage in the Bible in Daniel chapter seven and I began reading it. And as I'm reading it, I, I'm, I'm going boldly before the throne of grace. And I'm saying, God, you said this, that we had could find help in time of need. And I'm in need. And these are the prophecies that you've spoken over my children. And you promised, and you are the God who cannot lie. And, you know, you promised that you would be with my children, that if I would obey you, you would be with my children. And you said it here and here. And I began to take the prophecies over the rhema words over my, my children's life and 
take them boldly before the throne of grace and tell him that this is what he said. And Daniel chapter seven is where the ancient of days uh, uh, takes his seat. It, it sounds like an active tense. I only read English. I don't read Hebrew, unfortunately, but in the English, it sounds like an active seat. It says like he, he sat down, he took his seat rather than just passively sitting there. So uh, and later in the passage of Daniel 7, it says, and the little horn was waging war against the saints and overpowering them until the ancient of days pronounces judgment, pronounce judgment in favor of the saints. And so I know there's an eschatological meaning to that, but I, I was taking it personally and saying, God, you promised I, if I come before the throne of grace, I would find help. And you said this about my children, this and this. And I figured since God could sit down, he could stand up. So I began to pray at the top of my lungs. So I'm asking you, get up and uh, from your throne and pronounce judgment in favor of my son. Get up from your throne and pronounce judgment in favor of my son. And I said it over and over as praying uh, as only a mother can pray. But what happened in my son's body was incredible, that all of a sudden he could wiggle the toes on his left foot. And, he, you know, the doctor said, that's a good sign. It means there's some life in the spinal cord. My husband saw the, the x-ray of the spinal cord. He said it was like a noodle. And he said it was crushed. He said, he said it was, he said it was absolutely deformed. He says, and, you know, he was very alarmed. But, uh, and, and three days later, I got a, a, another prophetic word from an intercessor in Brazil. And this is, this is why I love, love, love prophecy, because it's the breakthrough point for miracles. This intercessor in Brazil said, Stacy, we've heard about your son, because my husband made a Judah Campbell recovery Facebook page. And he was calling people to pray and he was giving them updates on the on the thing on the facebook page and asking for prayer and this woman emails me from brazil and she said i want you to know we heard about your son and she said on saturday before i heard what happened to your son i had a very strong burden to pray for your family so i took the day off and i prayed the whole day for your family and she said late in the afternoon early evening she said i had a very clear vision so we have all these prophecies a month before a week before the day of and a couple days later and she says so i and the in the vision god was seated on his throne and he was looking at you with these amazing eyes of love. And nobody knows what I prayed in that room. I was all by myself. I saw God seated on his throne. And here he is in, in her vision. God was seated on his throne. He was looking at me with these amazing eyes of love. And then she writes, all of a sudden, God got up from his throne. And when I read those words, I knew that he heard me and that I had the petition that I had asked of him in the language of first John five. And, and so what, and, and, and Judas, you know, wiggling his toes. And then suddenly he can make a gasp pedal motion. And they, after that, he can lift his leg and all of a sudden the right toes begin to wiggle. And, you know, and then he could make a gas pedal motion. And after a couple of weeks, the doctor's, prop him up on a walker and he begins walking but they he said they said the hands may never come back they're, they're they're the last to come back if they come back they may never come back but long story short five weeks minus one day my son walked out of that hospital pushing his wheelchair he's never used a wheelchair he does everything he did before he even plays rugby touch rugby and, and he runs marathons, you know, he's got, he's been married, he has two children. And when he walked out of that hospital, remember the prophecy, I see a tsunami wave of healing hitting your church. It's going to affect a million people before Christmas. This was September 28th. He gave me that prophecy. My son walked out of the hospital on June, November 15th or something like that ish. But 
Over 1 million people had viewed Judah Campbell Recovery Facebook page. So every prophecy that I got a month before, a week before, the day of, you know, three days later, they were all working together to inspire the saints to pray, to see the miraculous breakthrough of the lame walking, you know. And so it, it's, it's, it all works together. God gives us this amazing gift to give us faith and to comfort us and to uh, exhort us to go for the, the big things that the scripture talks about. Praise God. What a story, Stacey. That's yeah. amazing. It I, is. Um, so, you know, just while you were saying that, I felt, I would say, a nudge um, to just throw this out for our listening audience. If you are in need of a miracle, it might be a, it might be a medical miracle, which this clearly was. Uh, but it might be a circumstantial miracle or some other miracle of nature or something. I don't know. But um, many times people come, they're only thinking of medical things. Uh, you might want to come to this conference because, uh, you know, Stacy has this testimony. There is power in testimony. Um, we have other people who are known to operate in miracles. You might just want to come because we're going to have time to prayer impartation. Uh, you might get your miracle at this conference. Um, certainly we are focusing on miracles and not merely healing. And again, I don't mean to minimize healing. I'm just thinking about, you know, a level beyond. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we do need a breakthrough that's beyond just a healing. So I, I just felt a nudge that way. It, it might well be a word from the Lord for some of you who are listening that you should you should take the step of faith and come. Stacy, talk to us a little more, uh, whatever your own theology or biblical understanding may be, how does this convergence of prophecy and miracles occur? What, do, what, what is that process? What does it look like for you when you've seen it occur? Is it, is it the same every time or does it differ? Um, well, I, I think the, the, the main thing is God is alive. God is real yeah. and he's a talking God. And I, you know, he speaks to us through his word, his divine nature and eternal attributes, Romans 1, are clearly seen by what has been created. He speaks to us through creation. He speaks to us uh, through primarily through his word, but but also he, he's alive and he also he wants to give uh, everything about God is relational. He wants to have a real relationship with his people he's always reaching out to people and and that's why he gives people dreams he wants to talk to them and sometimes it's it it's it's him arousing desire as it were to know him more to follow him more deeply and to pursue him because he he wants to be known as well. He, he, I will be known by you. He, he says those in the, in the old Testament, in the prophets, and he, he wants us to know him as well as he knows us. And even the whole new Testament bridal paradigm of Christ and the church, it's relational. And so it, to have a God that's just far away, that doesn't, we're never really sure if he's heard our prayers and by faith, we believe it um, that he's heard our prayers, but the, these little nudges of prophecy and also the breakthroughs of the miracles and the healings, they're God telling us that he's there, he's real and he wants to be known in his fullness, not just a part of him. And uh, there are many attributes of God that are manifest from the love of God is manifest. The, the, the knowledge of God is manifest. I mean, I've, I've prophesied over people that didn't know that God loved them. And somehow the Lord would give me his heart for them. And he would give me such a, such a message of love with a confirming piece of knowledge that only he would know that would confirm that he knows them and that he loves them because some people just feel like they've done so much sin or they're too, too bad or that, that God couldn't possibly love them or they're addicted. And so God can't love them, but God loves 
everybody equally. He's not a respecter of persons. And he wants to know you. And so the miraculous and prophecy, they're to create re deeper relationship. I believe that's the primary purpose in God's heart is to make himself more known to people so they would know him better. There's so many things I want to say to that, but uh, but this idea of people knowing God, it seems like in these last days with this outpouring that's going on, perhaps more than any other time, except maybe early in the creation of the world, um, God can be found. Mm -hmm. And whether he's doing acts of power or he's speaking, one or the other or both, people realize God is not a theory. That's one of the taglines I use. It's the title of this podcast. But you just said that so almost poetically um, that people would would realize just how intensely God loves them and that he is not far away. I mean, that that in a world that denies the reality of God, that is overrun with all the yik yak of, I don't know, opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, as Paul says to Timothy. I mean, to me, that's the goal. That's that's everything. And to say that, you know, this is what we want people to experience at an event like this but not just at an event in their entire life i mean to me that's i, I don't know how to say it any better than what you just did well paul said it in philippians three ten that i may know him yeah. and the power of his resurrection if the apostle paul prayed to know god in power how much more should we be praying that and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformed to his death and i think that's a progression that the deeper we go in because our god is the only deity that man worships that self gave his own son through suffering to bring the knowledge of himself to humankind. I, I And so there's so many parts of God that we really want to know. And the power of his resurrection is a starting point. That's, that's salvation, but it's also power in healing. And uh, we, we need to really be praying those prayers, the fullness of the knowledge of God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, Stacy, our time is about run. Um, just as we close, would you like to say a prayer for us and for our listeners and for the conference? Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord, we pray. Father, I ask, and I just want to pray what Moses and Paul prayed, what Moses prayed for his people, the Jews, and what Paul prayed for the church, where Moses said, I wish all God's people were prophets. And Paul said, I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you all prophesied. I pray, God, that in this hour of the ch of church history, Lord, where you're, we're moving towards the end of the end, Father, that this great outpouring where everybody uh, 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 that comes on all flesh, Lord, we are praying for dreams, for vision. We are praying, God, for prophetic spirit. We're praying for encounters. Lord, that the knowledge of God is released at an ever greater measure so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Father, we pray that uh, that they would not just speak in tongues, but they would also prophesy and encourage many people around them with the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Stacy, thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, for all of our listeners, this is a taste of what's coming up at the Fusion Conference. Um, as I said, there'll not only be teaching and kind of platform uh, speaking, but there'll be impartation, there'll be panel discussions, there'll be workshops. Uh, this is a place to come and get your hands dirty and to get hands laid on you, um, to be prophesied over and more. So we hope you'll join us in Nashville, October 18 to 21. Uh, Grant, do you have anything you want to add to this as we sign off? No, I'm just so grateful uh, for both of you taking time out uh, to do this and uh, look forward to seeing everyone at the conference. Apparently, there's a chance you could be the next Pope, you know? So who knows how that works? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, but um, it, I think that's incentive enough. You have to be a enough. Cardinal first to even get ah, in. The Cardinals, running. come on. And apparently there's 180 of them or so. I maybe more because about, about there's a lot of them. And so the odds are, are a little tight. 
Hey, yeah. you know what? But with God, all things are possible. And so we'll see how that all works out. Uh, and we're excited, uh, but it is going to be amazing. And um, I've heard several people, uh, Stacey, you're so, specifically about you, how excited they are uh, that you're going to be there. And so um, we're excited. So get your tickets and we'll look forward to seeing you back here next week on God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. The Fusion Conference is fast approaching. We would love to have you attend the event in Nashville with us. If you're interested in registering for the Fusion Conference, you can click on the link in the description of this podcast and register today.